Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you cannot hear me, go ahead and post something in the chat. Um, otherwise, I think I'm good to go. Um, I just, um, obviously, just unmuted myself. Um, so <clears throat> today, we're going to go through um, AR. And this is more of a, of a training. Um, and uh, what I'm planning to do is talk about the import process and the menu options in the AR module. We are planning on releasing this here on the, on the next release, making it production, making it live. So uh, we did have uh, ITCs uh, that had districts that did do the beta version, so they're on. Um, but um, for those of you that um, aren't, you know, uh, didn't go through the beta version with this new release, um, it's going to be out there. You don't have to go through the configuration configurations, you know, to get to the beta version. Basically, once this is um, running live, you're basically going to be going in to the modules underneath system. And you're going to install the accounts receivable module. So once that is installed, then you're going to see the accounts receivable option available appear. And it looks like it's going to be between utilities and the payroll integration. Okay. So that would be the first thing that you're going to do um, if um, your districts um, are wanting to use the uh, AR module. So with AR, um, there are roles that are included. So for your standard USAS users, they will not see, even you know, after the module is installed, they will not see the accounts receivable unless they have the role for it. So with the roles, I'll show you where those are at. So the role does need to be added. So if you've got a standard USAS user, um, that role will need to be added um, to their existing user account. And so you'll see here that we have the uh, AR read only, the AR standard, and the AR manager roles. Now all of that's in the documentation. So if you want further information about what all is in each of those, what permissions are in each of those roles, you'll want to go in to the documentation there underneath roles and look up the information. So for those schools that are not on the redesign yet, um, when they migrate over, the AR data will be an imported as part of their standard USSR import. So it's um, going to be in pulling all of the information off of the AR extracts, um, AR customer, AR header, AR payment information. So for those that have not imported into the redesign, migrated to the redesign yet, that will be part of their regular USSR migration. Now for those schools already on redesign and want their classic ARF data to be imported, then they need to follow the import steps that we have in the documentation. Let me show you where those are at. <clears throat> so this is the accounts receivable chapter. And we are going to be cleaning some things up here once um, the AR uh, beta is officially done, which should be by the end of today or sometime this weekend when they um, put out the new release. So I will be doing some cleanup here. But down here, there's a steps to import classic ARF data. And when I click on that, it's going to take me down to that section and give you step by steps on how to um, import the classic data into their existing redesign instance. So when this happens, um, one thing we want to make note of is that we strongly recommend, <clears throat> excuse me, running a test import of their um, AR data into a test instance of their data. Just making sure that you won't encounter any import failed errors or anything like that. So just like you would when you're doing um, USAS and you know, you're doing test imports in that to make sure that everything's balanced. Yeah. And looking, 
you want to do the same thing with AR. So you want to make sure that that information <clears throat> is, is loading in there correctly in a test instance. And if that looks good and everything loads in okay, then you can go ahead and do the live import. So with the import here, um, and I'm just kind of kind of re read through some of this so you guys get a feel for what's going on here. Um, so with this, there are three extract files um, from Classic using the SWAT extract. So there's an AR cust that includes all the AR customers uh, from our. There's an AR header and there's an AR item file. Those are the three that get generated from that SWAT export. So you're basically going to export that data out of Classic, transfer it over, install the accounts receivable module, and then, um, you know, obviously grant the appropriate AR roles for those users. Um, but here is the steps to actually run the imports. So there's not a lot to running the imports. You have really three different import steps. Um, but I just want to make note that when you do that, you have to run them in the following order. So it'll be AR customers, AR billings, and the AR payments. And note if a billing, or I'm sorry, if an import contains failed records, please don't proceed to the next import step until those errors have been reviewed and cleaned up. So for example, if you are importing your AR customers and you run into a couple customers that didn't import in, um, <clears throat> they are going to appear on a results file, but you want to have those cleaned up before you start the billing import. And the reason being, if those customers don't get imported in, you may have billings out there that are related to those customers. Those won't get imported in. So you want to make sure <clears throat> that everything gets imported in correctly. So one thing I want to make note of is that we so appreciate um, the districts <clears throat> who were included on the beta phase. Um, it helped um, a lot with getting these import errors and being able to document some scenarios, um, you know, I, we try to find the different scenarios, but you never know with um, districts data what you're going to get. So <clears throat> we have um, documented some of those import errors and put those out here. So with that too, we've learned too that we recommend for those districts already migrated to redesign and they're still using classic ARF um, and with the intention of importing their ARF data into the redesign. Um, they should keep vendors and accounts in sync with redesign. So that means if you create a vendor or an account in Classic that is being used in ARF in Classic, then that vendor account should also be created in the redesign for the import to um, not fail on those particular accounts or vendors. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so let's talk about these uh, imports here. And so with that, um, I just kind of want to go through, I'm kind of going to go back and forth between the instance and the actual steps here so that you can see what the screens look like. Um, so we're going to be going into the customer option underneath AR and um, there, and what happens is you're going to take that um, SWAT extract file, um, which is the AR cust file, and you're going to import that in. And what happens then is it generates a customer import result file. So before we get, uh, before I show you one of those, let me at least show you what it looks like um, when you're actually going into that option. So I'm going to go back to my screen here, and here's my AR menu, and I'm going to go down to customers. And we'll talk more about customers later, but I just want to talk about the import stuff first. Okay, so in here, underneath import, it's pretty straightforward. You're basically going in and uploading the file. So that file obviously has to be on, um, you know, loaded onto your laptop, your PC side. 
you're going to upload that file. The delimiter type is going to be tab. This is a, a, you know, a text file format. And then you're going to click on import. And then what happens then is it will generate um, a file with the results. So you're going to get, let me go back. You're going to get a customer import results file. And you'll want to review that see what's going on. So I think I have one pulled up through Notepad++. I mean, it's easier to see it. You can pull it up through Notepad if you want to, but I'm going to go ahead and pull one that I have. Pull that over. And so this is basically what a sample of what a customer import result file looks like. So it's going to show me how many customers imported and how many failed. And then it's going to give me the listing of the vendors that uh, failed. So if you kind of just read through this here, um, it's basically obviously the district IRN, what type of customer in R if you had C type customers, V, employee and student ones. Um, the actual number and then the address information and then at the end is the actual error. So it's telling me that for this customer, there's a data mismatch with the vendor of the same number. And so you're probably thinking, okay, what do I do with this? Um, what we're trying to do is build an import um, error um, document here that explains what could be the cause of these errors. And so let me go back. is down here. Underneath the import errors, we explain um, what these errors may mean. So this data mismatch with the vendor, this may indicate that maybe the vendor doesn't exist in the redesign. So it was an ARF, it, it's not. So let's say, you know, you, you know, already migrated into redesign six months ago and you created a customer in Classic an ARF customer, well, that's not going to import over because it's not a customer in the redesign. Um, so those type of things, it's going to make you aware of that um, and point that out. So this tells you what the error means and basically how to correct it. So, so far we've come across these two type of, um, it's got the same type of error, but what it could be, it could be that the vendor doesn't already exist or that the vendor does exist in redesign, but the data on the vendor isn't matching. The name or the address or something like that isn't matching. So they must match exactly. So there's where you may get some type of errors that we've encountered so far on customer imports. So what happens is if you run into an error, then basically, you can go in and correct that by going in and um, editing the uh, results file if you want to and putting the correct information on there. Um, and that can be done easily in Notepad++. Um, I'm going to pull that back up. So I can go in and make changes in here and make the corrections in here. And when I do that, then I can go back in to the import option and I'm going to upload the results file, this modified results file. And then that should take care of uploading the rest of those failed records. So I know we had some issues before with having to, um, you'll notice on this file, having to remove like these header rows. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, before you re-import it, we, it will ignore these imported and failed messages. So basically you make the changes you need to on the vendor lines, and then you save this file and you import this in. And then once you get a results file that says imported, you know, however many and failed zero, your customers have imported correctly. And so you're going to go then through the same steps with um, your billings and your payments. So you're going to go through 
and pull that, import that SWOT extract file. And I'll show you what that looks like underneath the billing option. And so with billing, um, things are a little bit different. You're gonna have a SWOT um, upload type and an import result, result file type. So obviously if you're doing your first import with the SWOT extract data, you're going to leave the default SWOT and then you're gonna upload those two files because there's an AR header and an AR item. And the AR header um, is going to contain the billing information in it. it. In fact, the AR header and the AR item records extracted from ARF are containing the billing and item information. So you're basically going to take those two files and upload them into the billing imports, and then you're gonna do it in the payment imports. So you're going to select those files. Again, you're gonna use the delimiter type, and you're gonna leave the to create new ledger codes. Um, that's the default. And then basically from there, you're going to import those. So that's one thing that I wanna mention here is that when you're importing um, your data, your ARF data in, like the billing payment and customer numbers will not be imported into redesign as the transaction and customer numbers that they had in ARF. They will be auto assigned a new number so the reason why that they must migrate with new numbers and redesign is because classic allowed the same number, like example for customers, you could have had a C100 and a V100, or on your ARF billings, you could have had a TRAN100 or a miscellaneous 100. So whereas in redesign, the transaction number is stored separately and it must be unique. So we have to, when those, you know, billings and payments get imported in, the legacy number is going to be stored, but they're going to be imported in with a new number. So something to keep in mind, um, that they're going to be imported in with a new number. But what's nice is that you can include the legacy number in the grids so that they can tie that back to their classic data. So um, just, you know, one thing to keep in mind. So when they're going in and creating billings and payments in AR, and you'll notice when I click on create, they don't have an option to put in a billing number, just the ledger code. So it's going to auto assign because it has to keep each number separate. And we'll talk more about billings here in a little bit. So, you know, when your districts start up and they're importing, you know, there are some districts that aren't going to import. They're using ARF and they decided, I'm going to start from scratch and I'm not going to import my classic ARF data. I'm just going to start up using um, the AR module and redesign. That's fine. But for those that have or are planning on importing their, their classic data, you know, one thing I would recommend that they do right away is add the legacy number onto their billing and payments and their customers so that they can see that information and, you know, compare. Okay, so I'll go back to my imports here. And so, like I said, you know, you're going to go through the same thing with the billing and there is going to be a billing import result file, again, that looks very similar to that customer one. And we are um, documenting um, errors that, um, as they're being reported um, and making sure we get those out there so you guys know what to do with those. And what happens then is if you do have some failed ones, you need to figure out you know, what's going on with those, make the corrections, and then you can re-import that billing import result file. And you'll notice if I go back, when you do the original import from the SWOT extraction file, it's asking for, you know, those two extraction files, the header and the item. If you're importing your result file back in, you make corrections to it, and you're importing this in, you'll notice that there's just one upload file, and that's the billing results file. 
So you'll import that in and that should finish then taking care of any billings that failed until you get, you know, an import record with zero failed records. And then payments, you go through the same thing and you'll upload those same two files. So again, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to the payments option. And again, my, you know, first off, I'm going to import my extraction files, the header and the item, and import that in, review the payment results file, need to make any changes. And obviously, when that happens, or if that happens, I know we've had a couple where they've had zero failed um, with their billings, so that's, that's been pretty awesome. Um, but if you do have failures and you're just not sure what to do, read a ticket and we'll help you with that. So get you familiar with it. Um, so that's no problem at all. Um, so, you know, obviously your original import, you're going to select the SWAT. If you have failures, you clean that up and you want to load that um, payment result file, you're going to select the import result file, upload that file and finish off importing the rest of your payment record. So once you successfully import all three of these, then you can go in down into the balancing reports. And we do have a link right here that clicks you uh, down to that. And you can start running balancing reports to make sure that what's in classic for our is balancing with what was imported into the redesign. Um, so I'm not going to go into major detail on these. They're all provided here. The only thing I really want to make note of, a lot of these reports um, that were in classic, we have the redesign counterpart to that. So um, your customer listing um, for this one, it, we don't really have a customer listing report, but you can go into the customer grid and run the report option and get the same thing. Um, the AR sum, uh, what I did is I created a JSON file that you can download here. And the reason I did that is because um, the legacy numbers are included in this. So it's easier to do comparisons. Um, so that's why I included that. So you can download anything that's highlighted in blue is a JSON file that you can uh, download and then run that and compare it to the classic file. So it's got the list of all of these in here and it explains, you know, what you're doing when you're going in and how you can run this. You can run it for all and look at the totals. You can run it for outstanding or just run it for payments or things that have been paid and compare the totals and make sure that everything's in balance. So I probably had, uh, this is probably overkill in <laughs> what all I put on here, but uh, you know, um, I just am trying to cover all my bases. So, uh, but feel free to use, you know, what you need out of these list of reports here. So we basically have, you know, the customer reports, the um, summary, the detail reports, they are trans kind of included in that same thing, summary detail. Some of this might be repetitive to what you see up here. The AR statement report. Um, we have a customer statement report out there that's a canned report. And I'll talk about reports a little bit later. You can compare the two. We don't have an AR age. Um, waiting for feedback on that as well to see um, if you know districts you know, really need this. Um, but I did create a JSON file that's similar to it. And then the AR receivable report, we did just, this will be included on the next release actually, so it's not out there yet on the beta version. Um, but this is um, a new accounts receivable can report that mimics the classic AR receivable report. So we have all of these reports out there that can be run for balancing. So just a couple other things as I'm glancing through all of these steps, 
is again, just to reiterate that the classic numbers will not be imported into redesign as the numbers they had in classic. So that explains this again. And also to make you aware too, that um, it's only gonna import the first 30 characters of each um, invoices item description on the import too. So it's just gonna you know, import those first 30 characters or something else to keep in mind. Okay, so again, this page is kind of our homepage for the accounts receivable. It includes the steps to import, import errors and your balancing reports. It also includes the ARF menu options. And so there are links to all the different options available um, in ARF in here. So you can go to these links and click on these and it will take you to those chapters. So before we get started on talking about the actual AR menu, do you have any other questions regarding the import? <clears throat> I don't see anything in chat either. If you do, feel free uh, to ask a question or post it in chat. Um, this, you know, to be honest with you, that I've been, you know, involved in this, but it's still new to me and what I can't answer, I can find out from um, our developers. So, uh, so if I don't know the answer to a question, I'll make sure I find it out and get back with you guys. Okay, well, what we'll do is we'll move on and we'll start talking about uh, the menu options. So I'm gonna go back to my AR menu. And like I said, once this module's been installed, you're gonna have all these different options here. And so really the last two are canned reports. Um, so we'll talk about those when we get into the reports. We've got about four template reports and two canned reports. Um, but what we're gonna do is cover all of these other options here. And so the AR ledger query is the bark of um, AR. So for those um, districts that love to bark and EIO, uh, guilty, I loved it too. Um, you'll be able to go in and query um, existing AR invoices and or billings and payments in here. I love this grid. Um, it reminds me of the activity ledger uh, query underneath transactions. So it's, it's modeled after that. Um, billings is going to be um, your ARF billing option, basically. Credits is something new. We didn't have that feature in Classic. It allows you to post credits. So we'll get into that when we get in, in a little more detail when we get to credits. Customers are your ARF customers. So that could be C-type customers in Classic, B-type, E-type, and S-type. So um, those, like I said, can get imported in through um, the import and they will show up in here. So we'll go through that in a little more detail. Um, ledger codes. Um, so these are your billing ledger codes. Payment locations. Uh, this is similar to your ARF remit address window. Some of you are like, yeah, I don't know what that is, <laughs> even is. Um, that's okay, because I don't know how many people used it in ARF, but in ARF, when you went into like creating an invoice, there was a PF4 menu, and in there um, contained an option to um, add remit addresses. So we do have a default one, which um, you can default to the school district's address, um, but they can also add other payment locations if they want uh, the payment to go to the warehouse or to their bus garage or you know some specific place on campus then they can go in and add more payment locations onto here uh, payments um, is your uh, payment or payment receipt option in ARF uh, and then um, your actual uh, two uh, canned reports that we'll talk about a little bit later okay so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into each of these and uh, just get you a little bit more familiar with how these um, run. So first off, I'm gonna select, I'm not gonna go to the AR query yet. I'm going to process something first and then we're gonna take a look at it, look at it in the AR um, ledger query. So the first thing I'd like to do 
is go to the ledger codes. Let's talk about those first. So whether um, they're importing the AR data manual, the manually or when a district migrates to redesign, the ARF invoice ledger codes are going to be imported into redesign. So however, in redesign, it's not a ledger code in a five digit number. It's just that makes up the invoice number. They're separated. So you've got, and you'll notice here, your ledger codes, these are your ledger codes. And then when you create a billing, there'll be a billing number that gets auto assigned. Okay, so when I go in to create a billing and I wanna make a, a billing for the elementary school, I can select this ledger code and then the billing number will get auto assigned. So basically my, if you wanna call it that, my invoice or billing number is elementary 1000 or whatever that number is gonna be. And so in here, creating ledger codes is pretty straightforward. There's really a, not a whole lot to it. So I'm just gonna view like the bus garage one here. In fact, I'm gonna select the elementary school. So in here, you're basically entering in the code and you notice we no longer are um, restricted to just four characters. Um, so I believe it might be 15 characters max, I'm not quite sure. Um, so you can't go crazy and I don't think you'd want to, um, but um, they can put in whatever they want here. Obviously, if they, you know, whatever was imported in is still gonna show like LM, if they had LM for elementary, it's gonna show that. Um, and then the description, so they can add a description to that. And then we also have uh, days till due, and this is a totally optional field. Um, so if I enter in like 90, um, when I use this then on a billing, the due date field will calculate 90 days from my billing date, and it will put that date in the due date field. So that's basically what that's doing. So again, and it hover over it, gives you the explanation. And this is all documented as well. So basically you're entering in a code, the description, optional days till due, and you save it and you're done. So that's basically how a ledger code is created. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to customers. This one is a little more detailed because you have your AR customers and you have vendor customers. So in classic, you had C-type customers, um, which were um, customers created in ARF. And you also had V-type customers, which were pulled from USAS. So in here, it works similar. So when I want to create an AR customer, um, I can go in and I can let it de default to the next available customer number. I can put something in here for this. I'm putting in my customer um, name and address information. And you'll notice here too, I've got three different types. Is it a customer, an employee, or a student? So these are just FYI fields. Um, obviously, if you had um, student or employee customers in classic that are marked with an E or an S type, those will get imported in and it will already um, include, you know, match that customer type in here. So those will already be designated. Um, so not a whole lot to this. And you'll also notice down here too, like I said, when these customers get imported in, they're not going to get imported in with their customer number from Classic. It's going to have to auto assign a new number to them, but the legacy number is stored. So like I said, I would definitely include the legacy number on the grid. You can go to more and include that so that you can cross-reference that until you get comfortable with the new number that's being used for that customer. So I, and you'll notice too, my grid. I try to put on here what I feel is the most beneficial. And this is just awesome because we never had this in classic and art. You can see everything for a customer. You don't have to go to that PF4 menu and look up a customer and stuff like that. It's all laid out right here. And so they can go to the more <coughs> option and add whatever they need to to the grid. So, you know, my big ones are 
I want the customer type. So I know, is this a vendor that's getting pulled from UCS R, or is this a customer that I created? You know, what's the customer number? What was the legacy number? Um, and then all the other information. And so with um, vendor customers, this is a little different because you're not creating a vendor customer in AR. You are pulling an existing UCSR vendor into the customer grid. So if you want to use the same vendor number that's currently stored under core vendor, you're going to bypass this first field and you're gonna go down to the vendor and start entering in the vendor name. And so I pull in what I want <clears throat> and I click on save and it's basically taking that vendor underneath core vendor and adding it as a vendor customer in AR. And so when it does then, it'll go in and that's why I've got the customer type so I know who's who. <clears throat> and then if, you know, if I want to filter and stuff like that, I can. What vendor, what customers are vendor customers? What customers are customers that were created in AR? Um, so I can go ahead and filter those if I need to. Okay, any questions about customers? So can you create a customer while you're doing a billing? No, you have to create the customer first and the customer option and then you can go into um, the billing and choose that customer. All right, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is payment locations. And so here's an example of a couple locations that I created. So I believe by default, it's gonna make the organization your default payment location. Um, but obviously, if you want to add other ones, you can, and it's very simple. You just click on create and add the information in here. Now, if there's one that's default that you're going to use most often when you're doing billings, you make sure that that default payment location is checked. So if for some reason, my bus garage was accidentally checked as the default payment location and I need it to be Sampleville schools, I can go in then and make, you know, edit that and make sure that it's checked here. And so what happens then on your billings and on your printed billings, this will be the default uh, remit to address basically. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty. We're gonna actually get into the ARF menu options billing payment billing payment <laughs> but you know a lot of that some of that stuff is just done away with basically we have billing and we have payment receipt um, so with the billings <clears throat> here are the options <clears throat> excuse me and so again it's so important to make your grid um, you know, what's going to be useful for them. <clears throat> and if they're importing over from classic, that legacy number is important so that they can compare that with um, what was created for that billing number and redesign. Um, but, you know, here I've got a lot of great information. I've got my ledger code, the billing number that was assigned, my customer, I can include the customer name if I want to, the date of my billing, what was my total amount for that billing. So obviously this is kind of similar to purchase orders or receipts. It's a summary. We're not gonna see every single item on that billing. We're gonna be seeing the summarized amounts. Um, so I've got my total billing amount, what's been paid, any applied credit. We'll talk about that here a little bit later and the remaining amount. And also I can put in, um, add a status if I want to, or who created the billing and all kinds of stuff. So, um, so they, you know, add whatever is important for them. 
So to create, uh, so obviously before I start creating one here, um, I can go in and select specific billings to print. Um, one thing while we're talking about printing is we do have templates out there for billing and payment. They're already provided out there in the documentation. So if your district wants, you know, they don't want to use the generic PDF version from here and they want a customized billing, those are available. And let me just take you quick where that's at. So if I go into um, the AR menu here, and I'm just going to go to our billings. Down at the bottom of the billings chapter is more information about creating a custom billing form. So like I said, we do have billing templates that you know you can start with, make any changes you need to in Word, and then we also have steps. We created this a while ago and how to create custom forms uh, for PDF transactions. And so you basically can click to get to those steps and it will go through the template form and how to then pick that when you're actually, you know, printing billings and stuff. So that's all listed here. Um, so, you know, it, like I said, if, you know, they did, you know, 10 billings today, um, instead of printing out each one individually, obviously they post their 10 billings and then they can select the billings that they've done for today click on print and it will give them the regular print menu like it does with any of our other USSR programs. Um, we already talked about the import option. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a billing so you can see what, how this works. Um, so this is our ledger code basically and I can use the drop down or I can go in and start typing in one and it should automatically pull that in. I'm just going to do bus garage. And like I said, it's going to automatically assign a billing number. Um, so because each number has to be unique, um, it's going to just find the next number on file. And uh, once it's posted, it'll be assigned. Um, my date, um, right now I'm in June in my test data here. And with AR, you, they do have the flexibility of posting future billings. So I can post them into the new year. Um, or if I'm already in the new year and I need to, to uh, and I'm still working out of the prior year, I can do that as well. I'm just going to go ahead and put in a June date. My customer, again, I can use the drop down or I can start typing something in. Um, the location, it should default to um, Sampleville Schools, so I'm just going to leave that go. Um, my due date, it's defaulting to today's date. If I have a days till due set for this particular ledger code, it would calculate if it's like 30 days for this ledger code, it'll calculate 30 days from the billing date and put that into the due date. see here. We've got an attention field in here. Oh, I got a question here. Does the period of the billing date need to be open? Uh, hmm. I'm thinking the, well, let me see. Let me see what I have here for my posting periods. Doesn't look like I have July open yet. So I'm going to try July and see what happens. So I'm going to leave that go, that date. All right. And once I, so if I have an attention field in here that I want to use, and that's up to the district, how they want to use that. Um, if it's the person that's um, supposed to be part of the billing or the person that needs to, I don't know, money's coming in for that person. 
um, whatever they want to use it for, um, we decided to put an attention field on here. I know that we have had requests down here in the item information for that customer reference field. Um, so that currently is not on the line item information yet. Um, and we were told from a few people that they want it for each line number because we asked if maybe we could do a, a custom field and put it up here. But you know, if they're referencing a specific purchase order or something like that, they wanted it in each line. So we do have a feedback issue for that in order to get that in here. Um, but you'll notice we got the service date, which was something that was in classic. Uh, the description. Amount. And my account code. So again, this works very similar to the other um, UCSR. So basically, I can start entering it in and it will pull it in. And you'll see too that the options here are very similar to what, you're, what you see in purchase orders and receipts and things like that. So they can add additional ones, you know, clicking on the button here, they can insert, they can delete, they can uh, copy, um, and they can resort, resequence. So if this is the only one that I have for this, I'm going to go ahead and save this. And again, I'm saving it with the July date. July is not open, so I just don't know off the top of my head if this is going to work or not. So let's try it out. So you get a warning, but it does allow you, even though the posting period isn't open. All right, so I've got my billing out there. Um, and you'll notice that when I did that, so was July created, somebody asked. I'm pretty sure that it would be, but let's check. No. It is not. So July is not created. So it allows you to do future ones, um, but it doesn't look like July of 20, fiscal year 2021 was created. And I think that's due to feedback that we got from the AR focus group is that they had, um, they had, you know, like building secretaries and people that were going to be off in the summer and they wanted to process those, but they didn't want, I, I don't know if they really wanted that period open per se, but they wanted them to get that information going on the billing. Now, obviously, if they're trying to apply a payment to it, that period has to be open. You know, that's got to be an open period. It's got to be created period. So if they're going to do a payment on it, it's got to have that period out there. But for billings, it doesn't appear like they need to have that period open. Okay, so going back to the billings. And so my billing that I just did was the bus garage one and uh, it's right here. And so again, I can filter and the filtering is, is going to behave the same way it does in any of the other modules in USASR. So this is what I love, love, love about um, the AR is that, you know, we have grids. We don't have, <laughs> we don't have the ARF windows anymore in classic. So, you know, you can go in and just pull in whatever you need to and filter and get the information you need. So it's awesome. And so obviously in here, if I made a mistake, I could go in and edit this one. And look, I don't have to go in and retype the description like I had to in classic <laughs> or go in, you know, and do cartwheels and flips in order to get this, the darn thing uh, um, edited, modified. So, um, yeah, so this is really great. So if I needed to go in and make changes to this, I can. And so, like I said, once a billing is uh, posted, you're going to get um, all these different options here. Obviously, I just went in to edit. Um, I can clone it. I can take this. I've got a, you know, 
10 billings that are about the same, except for maybe the customer's different, I can go to town on that. Um, I can apply a payment on this. Um, and so basically this is my payment slash receipt option in Classic. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, I can apply credit. So if there are available credits from this vendor, it has to be the same vendor. You can't be doing credits from one vendor to the next. Um, so for example, if I have an invoice out there, maybe it was uh, preschool fees and the parent paid um, too much. You know, it was $100, they paid 200. I made the payment for 200 in order to get everything to balance. Um, but I want to take, apply a credit to another one of their existing bills. <clears throat> I can do that. I can go in here then and apply that credit um, to show that, you know, that $100 on the next preschool billing. So we'll get into that here in a little bit. And then obviously my print option. So for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and apply the payment to this one. So I'm going to click on apply. And it takes me into the payment window. And then it pulls in the information from the billing. And again, what's really nice is that all this information is laid out. Where did it come from? It came from Ledger Code Bus Garage, billing 1026. Um, here's a description from the billing. Um, here's the amount. If I wanted to, if it was more or less, I could definitely do that. If I'm going to make multiple, apply multiple payments to this billing, I could go in and change the amount. And then obviously the account code that's tied to that billing. And so up here, like I said, um, the system's going to auto sign the transaction number. So that's going to be uh, grayed out. I can go in and put in the date. I'm just going to leave it as uh, today's date. I can put in, this is an optional field. It's just a check number. Um, if there was an actual check um, or some type of reference to their payment that they want to put in here, they can. And the only other thing I really want to point out is this guy right here, generate receipt. And so by default, it's going to generate a USAS receipt at the same time it does the payment. So this is the payment receipt option in R. If they just want to do a payment, then they can uncheck this box. And that's like the payment option in R. Um, so we decided to make it default because most of the time, it's probably what they're doing but I know that we've had, I think, some feedback about going in and I think, and I think we have a feedback issue on going in and making it um, set. So if you do have people in districts where like maybe building secretaries that are just doing the payment portion and then the treasurer's office is entering in the receipts later, um, that's fine. Um, but I think we have to have a way to kind of shut this off um, because it automatically defaults to generate receipt. A way to shut this off so that that person isn't um, posting receipts. Obviously, too, it depends on their permissions. So if they have a permission where they can't create the receipt, they're not going to see this option is at all. So you know you could set up a custom role for them and just include you know the specific options of AR that allows them to do billings and payments, and they won't even see this. So there are ways you know to work around this. So I'm going to go ahead and click on save. Oh, yeah, I'm glad I did that. I'm going to do that again. <laughs> I meant to do this. Um, so like I said before, I can't um, post this because I don't have a posting period for this. Um, so obviously, I'm going to have to back that up and make it a July uh, date or a June date. <clears throat> And then click on save. And then it, it posted that okay. So yeah, in my example here, my billing is a July and my payment is a June. So yeah, not probably the best um, option to show, but at least you see how it's working. So and then obviously once I post the receipt, 
um, I got a print receipt option here that prints the payment receipt. So again, I can use um, PDF or if I have a custom form that I created, um, again, that is available. Go back to this and go back to the accounts receivable. I'm gonna go down to the payment options here. And again, we've got these AR payment template that can be used um, in order to do a custom payment uh, form that you wanna give the person, um, so the vendor. And so um, with this particular customer then, if I wanted to see, so obviously the payment's going to be posted in the payment menu here, or the payment grid, I'm sorry. And you'll notice too, I take advantage of the fields that I want to show underneath payments. Um, and again, it's not going to um, point to a particular um, ledger and billing number because there could be multiple payments, you know, one payment made against multiple billings. So it's just a summary of that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and look this up now underneath the AR ledger window. And I love this thing. I really do. I use this quite a bit. Um, and it just depends on how you use it. It is a little daunting because there is a lot of information. Um, but obviously they can go into the more option and remove or add whatever columns they want. Um, so the way I have mine set up is I have it set up with the date and the type. Is this a billing payment receipt? So I'm kind of picturing how Bark works and trying to use that same type of theory in here. So here's my ledger code and my billing number. Even I put the item number. So obviously this is going to show you um, you know, the actual line item information, just like it does in the transactions activity uh, ledger. Uh, my customer, here's my billing information. My, I even can even put in the account code in here, which is awesome. My payment information and my receipt information. So I've got a lot of stuff on my grid. Others may not need as much, um, but to me, this is really helpful. So I could go in and um, do this bus garage billing that I just did, which was uh, 1026 here. And so um, what I can do is I can um, go in and just select that particular one and see what's happened to it. You know, what's, and I can start filtering. And I can see exactly what's happened with this. And what I like to do is I sometimes I'll sort on the date and then I'll sort on the type. Um, or I you know, can sort on just the date and then sort on um, you know, the transaction number or the um, billing item number if there are several. But this will tell me exactly um, what's going on with this. And because, you know, like I said, this wasn't the best example because my billing date is after my payment date. Um, so I just, I'll just flip it. Um, so here's my billing. So it's showing me that I did a billing for 3850 and I paid it. And this is the account code that's tied to it. Here's my payment that I made to it. So again, my payment number and the amount. And there's my USAS receipt. Receipt information and my receipt transaction. So I could go into transactions receipts and pull up that receipt transaction. So not only did it record it in AR, it also recorded the receipt in USAS. Any questions about the ledger window here? And yes, uh, that's a great, um, Heidi added here, a great option to pull a report that would look like an itemized statement if needed. Exactly. So they could go into the report option here and print off a report 
um, if they want to do it by a specific um, customer um, and every and anything that's done for that customer within like a specific date range they can use those date range um, like the dot dots to do a date range and pull in whatever they need to off of the report so this report option might be pretty handy for them okay so I'm going to go back to the menu here. So we covered the query, we covered billings, we covered payments, we've covered all of these except for the credits. I want to talk about the credits here. Um, but before I'm going to go back into billing. And I'm going to look at one that I made an overpayment on. So let me pull this up. And so here's a billing that I did for $100 and I made a payment of $200 on this. And so I overpaid on this one. And you know, I did a payment receipt and everything. So the money's in there. But what I want to do is I have another billing for Jill Jones um, that's sitting out there that I want to apply a credit on that one because of the overpayment I did on this one. And so what I'm going to do is find that other one. It's this one right here. And so for this one, um, here's the information on it. And it was for $300. And what I want to do is I want to take that $100 credit from the other invoice and apply it here. And so there are two different ways that I can do this. And this is all documented as well. It's in the billings chapter. It's got all the information about how to apply credits. So I can apply the credits in here um, by using either the apply credits. And when I hover over that, it's telling me it's going to use the available credit on the bill items. So this is like a quick, easy way to apply credits automatically. It's going to take that $100 and apply the credit if I click on that. And it's going to put that $100 in here and make my remaining amount 200 without me selecting the amount. It just takes whatever credit against that customer and applies it. Now, if they don't like to do it that way and they'd rather um, manage the credit and put in whatever specific amount they want, they can use this dollar sign manage credits option. Oops, sorry about that. And it's going to bring up the information about that item. And then I can click on apply credit. And I can go in and you'll notice the credits that are open then against this vendor. So I've got a couple here um, and I can select which ones I want, enter the in the amount and it's going to apply that amount to that existing billing. So that's one way to apply credits. So either by I'm sorry, that's the other way to apply credits. I can, I'm more in control of how much I want to apply. So if I just want to put in 50, let's say I select this one and I say I just want 50 bucks and click on apply credit, it's going to put that $50 in there and it's going to say now you have 250 left. And obviously if I made a mistake or something like that, I can go in and delete this credit and it'll go back to the 300. But you'll notice too, in the background here, you're going to see the applied credit. So now the available amount is $250. So that's another way to apply credit if you if they want to manage the amounts. Um, if they don't want to do a credit and they want to on it like a, another billing and they want to refund the money back to um, the customer, they can do that. And I'm going to exit out of here and go into the credit grid. And so in here, what I can do is I can select that particular one and do a refund credit. 
and it's going to pull up the information, you know, it's going to default to today's date, um, the revenue account that's associated with that. And then I've got, you know, it's going to default to create check. Um, I pull in the vendor and then, you know, are basically the same information you get when you're going to create a refund check. Um, and then I click on refund check and it creates the refund. And then I would have to go into disbursements and assign the refund trans or the disbursement uh, check number um, like you normally would with a regular refund. So one thing though to note with this, and I believe it's in the documentation, and I think we may have a feedback issue for this too. I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm gonna go to credits. And uh, like I said, the refund checks there, um, at this point, they can only be issued for vendor customers. So it's gonna be a vendor type customer. So if the refund that I'm doing is associated with an AR customer, I have to go in to core into vendors and add that as a USAS vendor before I can issue a refund check against it. So something to keep in mind. That way then I can pull that vendor in and create that refund check. So you can do refund checks from here as well. So this credits grid, you know, is basically allowing you to go in and um, create refunds out of the grid. If you want to apply credits to other billings, you're going to do that in the billings um, grid or in the billing option. Okay. Any questions about, I know this is a lot to take in, any questions about the options we've seen so far in AR? The next thing I'm gonna do is talk about reports. Okay, if not, the next thing I like to talk about is the um, canned reports that we see here, and then we're gonna get into the template reports. So, and I'm just gonna briefly show you these. There is a customer statement report that mimics the AR state report in classic ARF. So they can go in, select a specific amount um, and you know, specific ledger codes if they wanted to, start and stop dates and the output file. So more information about this is in the documentation. The accounts receivable report is the new one that's going to be on the next release. So that's gonna mimic the AR receivable report in classic. So again, the reporting date, the available period, um, you can let the fund type go or you can select governmental or proprietary, your sorting options, subtotal, and the PDF format. Um, again, I just updated the documentation on these. So I'm gonna go back and show that to you here. There is an AR reports link here underneath the AR homepage. And it talks about the template reports and then these two canned reports. So if I go to the accounts receivable link here, it takes me down and explains this a little bit further. Now the canned reports are these, and these are found underneath the report manager. So we have a billing detail and summary. So obviously the summary is gonna be a summarized version. It's not gonna include all the item information, whereas the detail will. We have an AR detail report that is similar to Classic's AR detail. And we have an AR tra transaction summary report, which is similar to the AR tran. So those again are all listed in, in, underneath report manager. And they all start with SSDT AR. So if you're not quite sure you know, what the SSDT report it, reports are for AR, they all start with that so they're easy to find. Okay. The last thing I wanted to touch upon with you guys is just getting a little bit of feedback from you guys. First off, I wanna show you, you know, where the AR issues and the AR feedback issues are because, you know, you may get a lot of questions from your districts about, well, I would like to see this and this. And, you know, it'd be best to go out there and look to see if these are already feedback issues. 
So I'm just going to go back into the AR feedback issues here. And this is under MUSASR, um, but it's got a label of AR in it. So when I created my filter here in JIRA, um, it's not a separate um, feedback um, group project. It's under the USSR feedback. It's just got a label of AR. So when we create, when SSDT creates these um, requests um, from you guys, we label it as AR and then you can go in and look in to any of those. So this is what we have right now in the feedback issue for AR. So we've got a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm sure we'll be adding more once some um, more users use it. Um, but at least you're able to go in and do a search and look for that information. Um, also the, uh, let's see. So yeah, so that's and basically any other issues um, that we need to put in is going to be that aren't feedback, but need to be done, uh, maybe a bug or something like that, those are going to fall in underneath the USSR um, uh, project. So um, they're not separate projects anymore. Now that we're on, the, you know, going to be including AR as part of the live production version and not beta anymore, it's all included underneath USSR. Um, so feedback from you guys, um, would you, and I just, you know, asking because, you know, I know you're thinking of like, how am I going to go about this with training and who's interested at my districts and stuff like that. Um, would you prefer, and you can put this in chat if you want to, or you can just tell me, you know, on the, um, vocally is, would you prefer, um, we haven't done this yet, a PowerPoint, um, or like training. Uh, would you prefer that we create like kind of a basic setup of you know, not the import stuff, but just basic AR PowerPoint um, that you can use then for your uh, districts? Would you guys prefer something like that? If so, um, I could definitely, you know, add it to our training and registration page. Let me go in there. And so what we'll basically do now we can hear. You know, basically we can add it underneath our training materials and include that. So I'm getting yes, yes, yeses for that. So um, we can go ahead and do something pretty, you know, generic that you guys can then go in and make any tweaks that you need to on that. Um, also, I have a question. Yes. Um, and I apologize if I missed it. What about if we already have districts on redesign, um, how can they get this? In other words, um, will their data come back from Classic? Or is their data just coming from the time they imported to redesign? So what, if they're still, if they're in redesign, okay, and right. they're still using Classic for ARF. Okay. Then um, at the very beginning of this um, session, I explained the whole import process and how you can take their classic data, extract it out, right. and import it in. So, okay. yep. So that's all in there. And it's, you know, let me show you too. I'll go back to the, the page here. Oops. steps to import. So it goes through all of these steps on how to take their classic data and import it into their existing redesign instance. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michelle. Welcome. And so one other thing, um, make sure I don't have any other questions here. Okay. Um, a processing guide. One thing that we did in USAS, and I know um, UAT ladies have been really helpful with this, is we created underneath USAS in our appendix. A general procedures that basically is a processing guide that goes in and kind of gives the end user a step by step on um, and it's real quick and it doesn't go into great detail, but it just provides <laughs> steps 
for them to go in and create, you know, purchase orders and receipts. And what we've done is we've started one for accounts receivable. And so UAT ladies have been helping me with this. And so I've added some stuff on here. I haven't completed it yet, um, but it's just a real quick and easy way for your end users to say, okay, how do I create a, a vendor customer? Um, then it just shows them, this is what you need to do. Or how do I create a billing? You know, how do I create, you know, this and that. It's got real quick and easy steps with not all the fluff in them. Um, so, you know, we started on this and if you guys feel that that would be really helpful, we'll continue on with this and get this out there so that you can basically point this to them to say, this is what you need to do. I mean, we've got the documentation too, but we've got a lot of screenshots and stuff in there. So if you want a quick and easy way for them to process, we'll keep adding to this um, so that um, you can, you know, reference this to your end users. Um, one other thing too that uh, we're looking into is generating, we have a FAQ page that we started. Um, and so in there, um, what we would like to do is start adding an FAQ for AR. So we've had these out here forever and I know a lot of you use these, reference these and point to them for your districts. So we're going to add an FAQ um, for AR as well. So we haven't started it yet, but that's something that we're going to work on. Um, I know that like one question that pops in my mind, <clears throat> and it wasn't, I think it was last week or the week before, is we had a question about they went in and did a payment receipt to the wrong account. And so how did they back that out? And I told them they could do a reverse uh, receipt and that didn't work. Well, we got that fixed. It's out there for uh, the next release. Um, so, you know, that's what I thought of is I can say, well, what if I posted to the wrong account or the wrong customer? These are the steps. You could reverse the receipt. When you do that, it reopens the payment that allows you to delete the payment, go back to the billing then, make any changes, different customer, different account, and then start over, you know, by doing the payment receipt. So we felt like it would be, with this being so new, um, that it would be a good thing to have an FAQ page as well. And, you know, we'll, we'll think of them, but I know that we'll think of more when we get feedback issues from you guys or, you know, questions, tickets from you guys. But um, I just wanted to let you know that that's going to be in the works as well. We're going to have an FAQ page for AR. So and the, that, again, will be in the appendix, just like the processing guide. And then, like I said, we'll get a PowerPoint going and we'll have that in the training page. So anything else um, regarding AR or things that, you know, you guys have encountered or would like to see? Okay. Well, I don't see anything else in chat. So um, I appreciate you guys taking the time here this morning to go through this. And like I said, I am recording this. So I'm going to put it out there as soon as the recording is ready. So that if there are things that you need to review, um, or for you know, if you've got a coworker that couldn't make it today, they can reference this um, at some time. So um, like I said, the release should be going out here. Um, either today or definitely by Monday, and it's going to include the live version of AR. So thanks, everybody. I hope um, that you guys all have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone.